Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's a very big pleasure for me to uh, have you all here. And because of uh, Professor Kanje, um, she's presenting today the Falkov uh, lecture. And um, we are very happy that she is here, not only the ones from working at the medical center and the students, but also the people working at the Radboud Center for Infectious Diseases. Um, she is a lady with a vast experience uh, on infectious diseases. Uh, um, and we made a very big and tight program for her because she is meeting many people. We took the opportunity of exposing a lot of people to her expertise. Uh, and um, I th I'm sure that she will inspire many of us. Um, but you are not only a very big expert on, the, on this field, um, but you are also a, a woman from the Middle East and um, with a very impressive career. Um, <coughs> her curriculum vitae covers about 60 pages. So we wonder how can you manage? Because the, the, the prototype idea that people here have on women in the Middle East uh, is different. So we thought, and that's also what we wrote to the selection committee, that we think that Professor Kanje can be a real role model for people here, not only for the students or for the infectious disease doctors, but maybe for all of us. Um, after this lecture, which she will give on antimicrobial resistance, she also talks to the students in the same hall and thereafter, there is a kind of, we know in the analysis, a television program which is called a college tour where she gets an interview. And then maybe she can talk a bit about uh, her life so you get an idea on who uh, Professor Kanji is. Uh, but you can also uh, ask her some questions maybe after, the, after she gave the talk. So uh, who is she? Um, she was born in Lebanon and she studied medicine there at the Université Saint-Joseph uh, and graduated in 1987. Um, and then the logical step was, she said last night, to go to Paris and continue the studies. But she didn't do that. She followed her heart and went to the <coughs> United States. Uh, looking back, that has been a very good move, uh, not only from a professional point of view, but also from a personal point of view because she followed her boyfriend and they got married. She did, uh, uh, it, but it was a difficult decision because going to the United States and doing internal medicine at Duke, because that's what she did, uh, that's, that's quite a challenge. Um, but she finished there in 1991 and then continued with infectious diseases and finished in 1994. And then she writes in her curriculum vitae, uh, which I found remarkable, in 1995, so that's one year after the completion of the training of infectious diseases, she established uh, the immunocompromised host service and infectious disease transplant service at Duke, which has become a leading training center in the United States. So that she already started one year after her uh, uh, training. But anyway, she didn't remain in the United States. She returned to Lebanon in 1998 and start to work at the American University of Beirut Medical Center, where she is now a full professor of uh, medicine and head of the Division of Infectious Diseases. And at the same time, she's still a consultant professor at Duke University. Over the years, she has become more and more visible in the field uh, uh, of infectious diseases and not all the large scientific meeting of the American and the European societies. And she is elected as a fellow of very many uh, prestigious uh, organizations, including the American College of Physicians, Infectious Disease Society of America, Royal College of Physicians of London, fellow of the European Society of Clinical Microbiology and Infectious Diseases, and so on and so on. So Professor Kanji is a expert, a wide expert, well-trained, 
in the field of infectious diseases, but over time developed a particular interest in infection control. And you do not do that only in the Middle East, but actually worldwide. So also there you are member of all kinds of committees which play a very important role, among others, several um, WHO groups. So you, I cannot uh, mention everything which is written in the curriculum vitae. It, it, we, you will not have time anymore for any, any lecture. But I can tell you that um, the number of achievements are many and very impressive. In recent years, you have been facing the emergence of gram-negative uh, infections resistant, uh, and you have been starting research on, on prevention, control, uh, etc. So I guess that your lecture, and we tuned your, your focus on that, and I would say your lecture comes at the right time and the right place. Why the right time? because antimicrobial resistance formation is threatening global health and WHO has made a clear statement on that. More people in 2050 will die from resistance, so it's not infectious disease, but the problem of resistance than die from cancer. And we need people like you to take action uh, so that we may still need, uh, can turn the tide. Is it the right place? Uh, I hope so. Uh, we are here in Nijmegen and we have a long tradition of working with a lot of people on, on infectious diseases. Um, um, and recently, uh, Radboud uh, has chosen infectious diseases as one of the major topics uh, uh, here. So, um, while joining the forces here in Nijmegen, we can link up with opinion leaders uh, like you are and do something about this uh, global problem. Before I give you the word, and I do that together with uh, Professor Heimann, who is a real expert on antimicrobial resistance formation also, uh, I would like to share with the audience some quotes uh, of you, which gives you a bit of a highlight on, on the person uh, behind who is sitting here. So I have three quotes. The first one, I think there's a very important one. In this century, medicine is about caring, teaching, and discovering. You also told me at lunchtime you have three jobs at the same time. You care, you teach, and you discover. So you are a real academic person. Uh, and I think that is essential in time of this rapid changing infectious diseases. Second thing is that your quote is, what does not kill you makes you stronger. And excellence is a habit and not an act. I think these words, they breathe a lot of power and also energy. And the last quote, consider that we are all students until the day we retire, is a wise and modest remark. So I hope that you and everybody in the audience now understands why we are happy that Professor Kanje uh, was selected for the Valkov chair, and why we think that you fully deserve it. I'm sure that you will inspire many of us in the coming week, but I hope also that you get inspired by people working here, so that we start new friendships and new collaborations, so we can join our fight against the emergence of infectious diseases. So, Professor Wertheim and myself, we will give you the official document and the medal. Okay. Afterwards, Dr. Uh, Heimann will take over as a moderator. Okay. So we're to commemorate the moment. We're really happy that you're here. And Thank you so much. We really look forward to your talk. So Thank this is you. Certificate and then... And here, shall I open it for you? Yeah. This is wow. The okay. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Okay. So, uh, Thank thanks. you, Andre. Thank you. Very happy. Hold it like this. What a, what a picture. Thank you. Andre, thank you. Your presentation of me was very humbling. Um, it's been an honor to be here. Uh, I really want to thank everyone on the selection committee 
for considering my application for this very prestigious professorship. Um, I'd like to really thank Professor Jos Vandermeer. I met him maybe 15, 16 years ago, and from the first time we worked together on a presentation at ECMED, I felt that this is the beginning of a friendship. I've only been here for less than 24 hours, and I've already really felt how special this place is and how special the people are. So I'm looking forward to the rest of the week, and uh, thank you again for this honor. I think uh, uh, such honors are bestowed on people, uh, not just for the scientific uh, achievement, but there is also a lot of personal commitment, and I'm really, really proud to have received this Valco professorship. Thank you very much. So the topic, as was uh, announced by Professor Andre, is going to be antimicrobial resistance, can we turn the tide? And I realize that uh, a lot of you in the audience are not infectious diseases specialists nor a microbiologist, and so I tried to simplify some of the concepts. To the expert in the audience, you might find that the information is very basic, but please bear with me. Uh, I thought for a general audience, we need to uh, simplify some of the material. So these are my disclosures. Uh, and I think you are well aware of uh, Sir Alexander Fleming's quote in 1928 when he said, when I woke up just after dawn on September 28, 1928, I certainly didn't plan to revolutionize all medicine by discovering the world's first antibiotics but I suppose that was exactly what I did. Antibiotics are among the most prescribed drugs in hospitals. It is estimated that up to 50% of hospitalized patients receive at least one antibiotic during their hospital stay. These are drugs that are not without significant side effects. They cause liver problems, nephrotoxicity, not an small percentage of anaphylactic reactions in our patients are due to antibiotics. But the topic of today is really to talk about the major collateral damage that antimicrobial use can do, specifically antimicrobial resistance, and as well as Clostridium difficile colitis that has become a major pathogen in many uh, care centers. A recent review on the use of antibiotic in the outpatient setting showed that 13% of all visits resulted in antibiotic prescription. Now, this would have not been bad, except that 30% of these were prescribed for viral infections. This is a recent study looking at antibiotic consumption per country. And if you look here, I think the Netherlands, which is a high-income country, has one of the countries that consume much less antibiotics than my country here, for example, Lebanon, a country that has only 4.5 inhabitants. And the uh, daily defined doses per thousand inhabitant per day for 2015 was among the top, as you see on this graph. But antibiotics are not only consumed by patients. Antibiotics are being used in veterinary medicine, in agriculture, as well as in dairy products. And in this FDA report, they mentioned that 31 of the antibiotics that are used in the food industry are very important antibiotics that we use to treat our patients, whether the penicillins, the doxycyclines, the erythromycin, and so on and so forth. And this study from ECDC looked at between 2013 and 2014, the increase in tons of active substances in humans and in animals, and as you see, in one year, there was a 10% increase in the consumption of antibiotics in the uh, food and animal industry. I found this study by Peter Hawking's group to be very interesting. They wanted to look at whether 
other places have also antibiotics. So if you look at, for example, drinking water, groundwater, sewage sludge, crops or soil, they found that a lot of the antibiotics are also present in these sources, sources that we don't tend to think about them. So whether we like it or not, we are exposed to antibiotics even if we're not taking pills. And for the people in the audience who are vegetarians or who like fish, this study was alarming because in the farmed fish in China, quinolone resistant genes were found in E. coli. So, so much for eating fish because it's healthier. So even the fish in China is exposing us to antibiotics. So again, from the animals, from the produce, the vegetable, etc., there are multiple sources where we as humans are exposed to antibiotics on a daily basis. And when we talk about bacterial resistance, this is not a new phenomena. In fact, the first reports of beta-lactamases were from 1940, just a few years after penicillins entered clinical use. And currently, this is not a problem that's confined to the hospital setting. In many community-acquired infections, we are struggling with very resistant pathogens. In my country, it's not unusual for a cystitis, simple cystitis, a patient coming to the clinic for just urinary symptoms to have a carbapenem resistant enterobacteriaceae in their urine culture. And the resistance occurs through complex interaction with uh, resistance arising by de novo mutation under clinical antibiotic selection or frequently by acquisition of some mobile genes that have evolved in the bacteria from the environment. So this is an example for how the selection occurs. You have a spontaneous mutation. You treat the patient with a drug that works against the susceptible pathogens. And with time, you have the resistant bacteria uh, becoming more uh, predominant. And when we talk about resistance, how do we define multi-drug, extremely drug, or pan-drug resistance, I think you will find many definitions, but the one that I've found to be useful is this one, where when you say extensively drug-resistant pathogen, it's when you have a bacteria that's resistant to all classes of antibiotics except one or two. And so a classic example uh, in my center, for example, is the Acinetobacter bomani pathogens that are resistant to everything except colistin and tigacycline. But we have started to see pan-drug resistant Pseudomonas aeruginosa over the past few years. And in this UK government report by Jim uh, O'Neill that was issued uh, uh, recently, they estimated that 50,000 lives in the US and Europe are lost every year due to antimicrobial resistance. And if we don't get our act together, they predict that by 2050, 10 million people will die annually due to antibiotic resistant bacteria, an estimated one death every three seconds. And so the routine surgeries that we now do without worrying about them, uh, C-sections, uh, uh, appendectomy, etc., will carry a tremendous risk when you are uh, struggling with resistant pathogen. And it is estimated that Asia and Africa will suffer the most from the antimicrobial resistant pathogens, uh, again, if we don't uh, uh, change what we're doing now. And bacteria are very smart creatures. They do have multiple mechanisms of resistance. Obviously, the most common are the beta-lactamase production, but there are many other mechanisms of resistance, and it's not uncommon to have a single bacterium producing two or three different mechanisms of resistance at the same time. And I think many of the ID and microbiologists in the audience are aware of this WHO a recently released report. Uh, so Evelina Taconelli uh, took the lead in this work and I was happy to be part of it, where they tried to uh, find like what are the most troublesome pathogens uh, that the world at large is struggling with so that they can 
focus on prioritization of where the effort should be. And as you see on this uh, slide, the top pathogens are no longer your staph aureus methicillin resistance. It's not your vancomycin resistant Enterobacteriaceae. The top pathogens are your gram negative pathogens. And on top of the list was Acinetobacter baumani. And so they classified the other pathogens as high priority and medium priority. But all the critical priority pathogens were uh, gram-negative pathogens. And this is why I will focus most of the presentation on those pathogens. Let me start with Acinetobacter baumani. Luckily, you don't have it in your hospital. In a session that we did this afternoon, we talked about all the major outbreaks that we had with Acinetobacter in my center. And if you look at the prevalence of carbapenem resistance among Acinetobacter <coughs> in the world, you see that there is a big problem in South America. South Africa has uh, Acinetobacter MDR, but really the Middle East is also struggling a lot with MDR Acinetobacter. And so last year, I got this invitation from the uh, Lancet ID editor to write a review on the epidemiology of common resistant pathogens in the Arab League. And Lebanon um, is just this tiny country in the Arab League. You can barely see it on the map. Uh, and so initially, uh, we were very excited about this work. But when we started to gather the data, we realized how big of a challenge that is, because a lot of the published studies had significant variability in the techniques used to interpret susceptibility. Some use the European cutoff, other use the American CLSI cutoff, the origin of the tested specimens. And in some of the studies, they only focused on the invasive isolates, other combined colonizers, as well as invasive. So to sit and dissect through the data was really a big challenge. And it took us several months to complete the work. But so let me share with you the Acinetobacter uh, uh, epidemiology in the Arab countries. And as you see here, Egypt has a major problem where more than 50% of their isolates are carbapenem resistance, Libya as well, and Jordan. My own center, in 2000, we had 99% susceptibility of Acinetobacter to carbapenem. In 15 years, this dropped by significant numbers. So now only 10% of our isolates are carbapenem susceptible. And these are not just colonizing pathogens. They are major contributors to our uh, healthcare associated infections. In fact, in 2016, it was the most common cause of ventilator associated pneumonia. It was a very common cause of uh, war-related wounds, and we get a lot of wounded patients from Iraq and Syria. And also in bloodstream infections, I think if you look at the data throughout the world, you will see that bloodstream infection, staphylococci are the number one pathogens, but in 2016, we had more acinetobacter than coagulase negative staph. And this would have not been as bad if the mortality of infection with Acinetobacter wasn't as bad, but look at these numbers. Between 52 and 65% of the patient who acquired this pathogen die with it. The attributable mortality in 2014 was thought to be uh, 45%. And so recently, we looked at a case control study to try to compare the mortality of the susceptible Acinetobacter to the resistant Acinetobacter. And as you see, the mortality for the resistant one is a lot higher, 55% compared to the susceptible one. So these resistant pathogens are killing our patients much more. And these results uh, were also corroborated in a meta-analysis published in 2014, where you see that the overall mortality of this pathogen when it's carbapenem resistant was 54%.
And it's important whenever we have such a pathogen to look at the molecular epidemiology. And in our center, it was mostly an OXA23 Acinetobacter bomani, different than the Acinetobacter that they're seeing in Turkey, for example, which is another country struggling with uh, Acinetobacter MDR. Now, if we ask the question, why are countries in the Middle East at increased risk for resistance? There are many reasons, and I've listed them here. There is a heavy travel in the Middle East. The business, you know, in Dubai, in Abu Dhabi, all this hub with the travel. The Hajj pilgrimage, which brings together typically between two to three million people yearly from all over the world to gather in Mecca, that also brings a lot of possibility for bringing resistance. Winter holiday destination. There is also many of the Arab countries are uh, countries with high rate of expatriate populations. A lot of Indians, Filipinos, Sri Lankan uh, work as domestic workers uh, uh, in these countries. And these come from countries that have high rates of resistance. Also, antibiotic abuse, lack of regulation, and there are many countries in the Arab world where they have very little infection control practices, and that could contribute to the uh, emergence of resistance. Another pathogen that is really another one that the world is struggling with is the Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and you know this historically is a pathogen that we fear a lot because of the high mortality. And so this is a recent WHO report, and as you see some parts of uh, Asia here has very high resistance rate. More than 50% of their Pseudomonas is carbapenem resistant. Well, the situation in the Arab countries is not different, as you see, Egypt and Jordan have very high resistance rate, more than 30%. Uh, in Lebanon, it's slightly lower, but also it's very variable from one center to the other. In tertiary care centers, the resistance rate tend to be much higher. And when we looked at the molecular mechanisms uh, by which Pseudomonas become resistant in the region, some of them were the classically known one, the VIM, the IMP, etc. Uh, the one in Lebanon, we had OPRD gene in Lebanon and Algeria, but there was some isolates from Qatar having some resistant genes that had never been reported before. But really, when we talk about gram-negative pathogens, I think Acinetobacter, Pseudomonas are terrible pathogens, but these tend to be mostly hospital-acquired infections or infections that we can manage in the hospital. In my opinion, the Enterobacteriaceae are really a much bigger problem. And the reasons are listed here. Every one of us in this audience carries millions of Enterobacteriaceae in our intestines. These are pathogens that swab resistance mechanisms they acquire resistance among travelers, and the percentages of extended spectrum beta-lactamase producing Enterobacteriaceae has been increasing and has become alarming in many countries. And more recently, the Enterobacteriaceae have now become carbapenem resistance, leaving us with very little options to treat. This is the situation of Klebsiella pneumonia resistance to third generation cephalosporin in Europe. And as you see, some countries, for example, if it, we take Italy, more than 50% of their Enterobacteriaceae, Klebsiella in this particular example, are ESBL producers. Again, in the Arab countries, we have similar situation, mostly in Egypt, but also in Syria. Uh, where there is currently a conflict and a lot of use of poor generic of antibiotics and practically no infection control practices. But this interesting study looked at what happens if you go and travel to a destination and come back with an infectious diarrhea, and what is the likelihood that you will carry an ESBL producer after your visit, and they looked at the various destinations. 
So for example, if you travel to Europe, excluding Sweden, the chance of acquiring ESBL was 0.03. But if you went to the Middle East, 40% chance of acquiring ESBL. If you went to Egypt, which is in the Middle East, but particularly for those in Egypt, 50%. But if you went to India, you have an 80% chance if you acquired infectious diarrhea that you will be carrying ESBL producers in your gut. And why do we have that much variation? Obviously, we have a lot of different antibiotic practices, uh, and as I mentioned before, but I was very surprised to see this in the Asia news that only half of the population of India has toilets and a mobile phone. So they have a mobile phone, half of them, and half of them have toilets. So it's really sad to see that. Uh, and it's important when we talk about uh, Enterobacteriaceae uh, and we talk about resistance and ESBL producer to try to know the molecular mechanism of resistance because that has implications for treatment but also for epidemiology. And when we looked at the first uh, batches in 2008, we were surprised to see that 45% of our E. coli had the three different enzymes production at the same time, which was uh, really very surprising. And we know that prior use of antibiotic is perhaps the most important risk factor for selection for ESBL producer. And this was confirmed by this case control study that showed that the odds ratio of becoming colonized with an ESBL or infected is seven times higher if your dentist prescribed amoxicillin a month ago to you. And so that's why we keep stressing on the message of prior antibiotic use. And so we used and abused carbapenems because we were taught that these are the best drugs to treat extended spectrum beta-lactamase producing enterobacteriaceae. And with the excess use of carbapenem, now we have a bigger monster in our hands, and that is the carbapenem resistant enterobacteriaceae. And so the first one was described from North Carolina, where I did my training, but within very short time in this nice review by Patrice Normand, you see that the Klebsiella pneumoniae carbapenemase producer has spread all over the world. But really, this is not the full story. Carbapenem resistant enterobacteriaceae are not only the KPC producers, you have many other enzymes, and I, I don't, I don't want to bore you with the detail, but just to tell you that depending on which enzyme, you have different antimicrobial hydrolysis properties. Uh, so they're not all considered to be the same, and it's important to know the molecular mechanism in your own country or preferably in, in your own center. This is from the ECDC report of April 2016. And as you see, Italy and Turkey, for example, they've reached an endemic situation with Klebsiella and E. coli that have become carbapenem resistant. And this really is a major problem because we don't have too many options to treat these infections. But outside the US and the uh, European countries, you have now CREs everywhere else. In Africa, in the Arab countries, um, it's really, if you do a search, almost it's been reported uh, in every country. So the rates for us in my hospital, 9% of our Klebsiella are carbapenem resistant enterobacteriaceae. That's a very alarming number. And so when we uh, looked at the molecular analysis of these isolates, the first year when we described these carbapenem resistant enterobacteriaceae, it was in two patients who came to us from Iraq in 2012. And back then there was a lot of hype about the NDM1 or the new Delhi metallobetalactamase producer because they called it New Delhi because the patient was from, uh, who was reported from India. And so initially we thought, you know, this is a problem that's going to be limited to the Iraqi patients. But sure enough, within a short period, 
we started collecting the isolates and we found that the molecular uh, uh, analysis of these isolates were, uh, you know, OXA48, but some of them had multiple mechanisms, as I mentioned at the beginning, these bacteria are really very smart one, porin loss, efflux, malfunction, and more recently, uh, this is recent uh, uh, analysis of a large number of carbapenem resistant enterobacteriaceae, and as you see, a lot of OXA48, a lot of NDM1. Surprisingly though, no KPC, no Klebsiella pneumonia carbapenemase. Unlike what they have in Saudi Arabia, for example, unlike what they have in Jordan. So even though we are countries very proximal to each other, but we have different epidemiology. And this has implications for treatment because if you have a carbapenem resistant enterobacteriaceae that is NDM1 producer, even the newest drug on the market that is ceftazidime avibactam will not work against this bacterium. And when we uh, looked at the uh, uh, comorbidities of our initial uh, group of patients who had carbapenem resistant enterobacteriaceae, we found that a lot of them had comorbid conditions, renal insufficiency, malignancy, diabetes, and a large number of the patients had surgery uh, within the last 30 days. But very importantly, 30% of these patients died. And of those, when we did a very rigorous analysis, uh, we thought that the attributable mortality of these were, was 80%. So uh, again, Enterobacteriaceae are really bacteria to be respected now. They cause a lot of uh, problems. And two years ago, after we used and abused colistin because it was a drug that we kept on the shelf for many years and had to use it again because we had not many options to treat our patients with extremely drug resistant pathogens. And now we have reports of resistance to the last resort antibiotic, which is in this case colistin. Initially described in China, but now it's reported from many other countries and in my own country, uh, we have a lot now of colistin resistance. And actually, last year was very alarming because we had a significant drop in the susceptibility of acinetobacter from 93 to 56%. And we were really abusing inhaled colistin because for the acinetobacter infection, we had not much options to treat, so we were using colistin intravenous plus inhaled colistin, and so all this overuse led to the resistance. So we know that antibiotic resistant pathogens increase morbidity, mortality, the rate of complications, the length of hospital stay, but not to forget about cost. And I think administrators usually care a lot about the patients, but they also care about the cost of hospital stay for the patients. And so when we look at the drivers of resistance, some of them are patients related and you can't do much about it. If your patient has significant immunocompromised state, you can't change that. Uh, the bacteria, as I explained, has a lot of mechanisms of resistance, but it's really the drugs, how we use our antibiotic is where we as healthcare workers can have a major effect to try to arrest the uh, progression of antimicrobial resistance. And I found this paper in Lancet from 2005 that correlated penicillin non-susceptible strep pneumo with outpatient penicillin use. And we know that the more we use penicillin, the more we have resistance, but you are at the just the bottom, the last one on the curve. So, I, and I hope it stays like this. And Sir Alexander Fleming did recognize that very shortly after his discovery of penicillin, he said, the thoughtless person playing with penicillin is morally responsible for the death of the man who succumbs to infection with penicillin resistant organism. And this would have not been as bad if we had too many options available for us to treat in the future, but the antibiotic pipeline is really drying up because antibiotics don't generate a lot of money for pharmaceutical companies. And recently, there has been, again, a renewed interest, and I put it bacteriophage a la mode, because in French, a la mode is, this is the fashion, 
because this is what people are talking about now, and there are whole conferences to talk about bacteriophages. But this is not a new concept. In fact, in 1931, Felix Durrell uh, wrote this article in the bulletin of the New York Academy of Medicine, and the title was Bacteriophage as Treatment in Acute Medical and Surgical Infections. In Russia, apparently, you can find these over-the-counter bacteriophages for various antibiotics, and also in agriculture and livestock use for bacteriophages. And more recently, there are a lot of you know, case reports uh, published over the past two years on the various use of bacteriophages. Now, I must say that I'm not too convinced that this is the solution, because in a lot of these cases, they gave them bacteriophages with a lot of combination of antibiotics. And to say which one caused the benefit, it's hard to tell. I think we need uh, more time to think about whether bacteriophages uh, are going to play a role. And so the question is, can we turn the tide? Um, uh, and that was part of the title of the grand round. And I think we really need to think about how we are using these antibiotics that are available to us. We know that if we s delay proper antibiotics, we increase the mortality of the patients because this has been shown in many studies. And this is just one of them showing that the odds ratio of dying is four times higher if you give your patient an antibiotic that turned out to be not the correct one. So there is that pressure in clinical practice to make that right decision. But we know that antibiotic cause a lot of collateral damage, so we really need to be thinking about this balance. You wanna give the proper drug very quickly, uh, but at the same time, keeping in mind that indiscriminate use of antibiotic will select for resistance. And in this nice review by John Bartlett that is titled Seven Ways to Preserve the Miracle of Antibiotic, the second item was to aggressively promote antimicrobial stewardship. And I'm very happy to be here at Radboud University where you really were the leaders in antimicrobial stewardship for the Netherlands, but also for the rest of Europe and, and the world. And I think we need to put a lot of efforts in the stewardship. And so part of the International Society of Chemotherapy, that I happen to be one of the core chairs of the uh, ISC study group on stewardship, we put a lot of effort to spread the importance of antimicrobial stewardship throughout the world even doing running distance learning modules to countries where uh, they can't come and attend conferences, particularly in Africa. And so we put together some practical uh, papers for just the students, the internists, the general practitioners. The first one was 10 commandments for the appropriate use for the practicing physician in an outpatient setting. And Hyman was part of the second one, which was the key point for the use, proper use of antibiotic in the, out, in the inpatient setting. And these are really very simple uh, steps, but these are really important steps that we reiterate in rounds every single day. Did you take cultures? Did you drain your abscess? Did you de-escalate after you have your culture results? So th they're really very simple point, but clinicians tend to forget about them, and so they need to be reminded. And so stewardship is really a, a multifactorial strategy, and so we need to incorporate all the efforts together. The infection control efforts, improving diagnostic, uh, benchmarking and education, and I think if we incorporate all these together, we will have a successful uh, stewardship program. Now, in the interest of time, I'm going to run through the stewardship part, but quickly, again, recognizing that you are in this institution a leader in this, and you are very familiar uh, with what stewardship is. But basically, stewardship is you want to give your patient the right drug, the right dose, and the right duration. We find that a lot of patients, especially the surgical patients, receive long duration of therapy uh, for really unindicated um, uh, uh, conditions. 
And then it's important that once you have your culture to de-escalate. So basically it's the responsible use of antimicrobial agents. And I think here you have a very large team, but when we started establishing the stewardship in my hospital, it was very important to pick the team, which is an interdisciplinary team. You need to have an infectious disease a person, but also a, a pharmacist who has a key role, a microbiologist, an IT specialist. And in my program, the IT specialist was very important to design for us an electronic uh, antimicrobial approval form to get to the hospital administrator because stewardship efforts will not succeed if we don't have the support of the administration. We have to go to administration and tell them you're going to pay money to hire the physician and the pharmacist but over the long run you are saving tremendously because every added hospital stay is a lot of uh, extra cost. And so there are these strategies for stewardship that have been very well established. These are the IDSA guidelines in 2007, and they were updated in 2016. And basically they say the same thing. You need to educate your staff, your students, your prescribers. Formulary restriction continues to be recommended. Audit is very important, but the importance is to feed back the result of the audit. If your surgeon is abusing antibiotic and you collect the data but you don't share with them the result, it, it's not successful. Uh, uh, guidelines and pathways, and in my center we've really tried to adopt a lot of these uh, uh, strategies and, and, and I'm happy to see that a lot of it has been uh, quite successful. For example, combination therapy for Pseudomonas infection, it has been the dogma, but when we looked at the data, it turned out that there is really not much evidence to say that we have to routinely use Pseudomonas uh, double coverage for bacteremia. So now we changed our practice and there are only certain scenarios where we allow uh, combination therapy. But whenever we do stewardship, I think we have to share the outcome with the right people. And it depends on the goals. If when you looked at your data, you decided that your primary goal is cost saving, then you need to look at all these parameters. After you implemented your stewardship, did we save in the amount of prescribed drug, in the cost, in the duration? Were, you, were we very effective in the oral uh, to IV switch for drugs with high bioavailability. Or in some centers, they are more concerned about clinical goals. We don't care about the cost. If you're working in a hospital in Saudi Arabia, they will tell you, I don't care about the cost. I need to improve on my patient's outcome. But then you need to look at what happened after you implemented your stewardship effort. Did you reduce the length of stay, the mortality? Or very importantly, the Goal could be microbiological goals. What happened to antimicrobial resistance? Did we reduce the resistance after we implemented the stewardship efforts? And again, I think stewardship cannot be done alone without proper infection control practices. I think, you know, hand hygiene, uh, Andreas Voss, I think, works here, and he's done a lot of work with hand hygiene, the bundle approach. Uh, in 2012, we signed the Hand Hygiene Pledge at my university for the entire country. And since 2012, now we have in every single hospital in the country a hand hygiene solution uh, in the small and the large hospitals. And we recently decided to put this effort together because we uh, realized that you can't apply the same strategy in all uh, in developing countries as in developed country. And so we try to have some recommendation for what can you do to adopt. So the message of the DPT has been adapt to adopt for hand hygiene. And so we're, we're doing that. And so outbreak investigation is very important. We spoke this afternoon about how in our investigation for Acinetobacter infection, we found contamination of the ventilators the portable x-ray, but even the mattresses and pillows uh, were contaminated, not even though we changed the sheet, but the mattress itself had the uh, pathogen. And by molecular typing, you can always link the source of the 
uh, contamination uh, to the outbreak. And I think it's a tool that is uh, very helpful. And obviously, there are many barriers to stewardship, and not all of them uh, are insufficient leadership commitment and insufficient funding. This report from an Australian study that looked at 11 hospitals uh, between May and September 2012, looking at what are the barriers to implement antimicrobial stewardship, they listed all of these factors. Lack of enforcement, lack of willingness to change, a lot of transient staff where you teach that staff and within a month they change and now you have to teach again. Uh, lack of financial support was one of them. And in many centers, it was just lack of leadership commitment to the idea of stewardship. But even if we do all that, we continue to have a lot of challenges. And I think stewardship is no longer something that should be only applied to the hospital setting. It should be extended to the outpatient setting, primary care, to the long-term care society. For those of you who were attending ID Week in San Francisco last month, half of the sessions were on antimicrobial stewardship in all the various scenarios, and it was nice to see that. And the Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN has really called for the reduction of the uh, use of antibiotics in our farms and in our food. And so we're hoping that with their efforts as well, this will lead to improvement. And the UN uh, called for an urgent need for coordinated global action in 2016. They held a very high level meeting on antimicrobial resistance and came uh, with uh, very important recommendations. But perhaps the most important model now is to talk about the One Health antimicrobial stewardship model. Because if we wanna be successful, we shouldn't be working alone. We should really be involving the Department of Health the Department of Agriculture, the Board of Animal Health, even the Pollution Control Agency, as they done in this um, Minnesota One Health. Uh, so we're doing the same in my country where we have a very high level meeting next uh, week where we involve the ministries of all these um, uh, you know, uh, specialties because we felt that it is an urgent need to work all together. So I think this is my last slide, and to allow a few minutes for questions, I'm gonna stop here and be happy to take questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Kent, for a wonderful overview. Are you optimistic for a future? Uh, I will only be optimistic if we work as a group, and I think under the umbrella of WHO, and the AMR you know, group and all the efforts that I've seen over the past two years, I am much more optimistic now than I was two years ago. Um, this is a problem that has to be solved as, at the top, top level. Uh, it's not because with all the travel, as you said, with all the transfers, even if you have the best program and low rates in one country or one hospital, Ultimately, it's something that's gonna become global. So I think we have to work really at the highest level, uh, regional, but also, you know, under the umbrella of WHO, I think that will be the best to do. Thank you for, for a great talk. Um, if you look, of course, the, the development of resistance is one thing, but the transmission of a resistant microorganism from one person to another is another part of the story. And um, in a country like this, where we have relatively low or very low resistant rates, you can do some uh, investigations. And actually, Christina van der Broeke in Amsterdam did a nice study where they looked at uh, the colonization of, say, normal Amsterdam people and found that, for instance, the use of um, uh, proton pump inhibitors was a very important determinant of acquiring uh, resistant uh, uh, gram negatives in, in the stools of the patient. And of course, that's quite logic. So the question came up to, to me to ask, to ask you about the 
uh, use of proton pump inhibitors in the Arab countries because of your widespread uh, yeah. transmission, apparently, of, of yeah. So uh, pe yeah. resistant organisms? Yeah, thank you very much. This is a very important question. So, And it is actually in uh, my hospital and um, uh, the GI group, my husband was interested in the correlation between PPI, uh, PPI use and Clostridium difficile colonization more than the Enterobacteriaceae. And so they did a large study looking at that. Uh, I don't think there are any studies that have looked to correlate that, but I can tell you that PPI use in the Arab countries in my country at least, is very, very common. With every antibiotic intake, people take PPIs. Uh, with every medication, people take PPI to protect their stomach. And so now we have, an, at my hospital, a PPI stewardship program, actually, that was initiated by our gastroenterologists who go around and look at who are taking you know, PP, various PPI and decide whether it's indicated or not. So theoretically, it's definitely possible, but has not been looked at in a rigorous manner. If one of the things you could think of, of course, in a country like this, where the proton pump inhibitors are the best-selling drugs, yeah. uh, they are, you can buy them over the counter. Yeah. And bring them back to, say, yeah. prescription-based yeah. drugs. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, you say um, you want to kind of um, start in high places and um, influence uh, policies. But when I, I, I come, I, I visit South America a lot, for example, and each time I come there, I see another pharmacia uh, opened in the main plaza. How are we going to control big pharma? And another thing I want to add is there's a very nice microbiome study that uh, indeed says um, that uh, the use of PPI that really harms your, um, your yeah. microbiome uh, yeah. to a great degree. Right. So um, how are we going to control Big Pharma? That's a, one of the most difficult questions because I tell you in many countries, um, in the developing countries particularly, it's big pharma who are financing to do some research. Uh, they don't have similar funding opportunities such as the US or other major organization. And so big pharma knows that and they feel that, you know, there is some dependence on them. At the end of the day, I always say that it's your conscience at stake. Uh, and when, when any pharmaceutical representative comes to my office to invite me to do this and this and that, or to give a donation for my research, I always tell them this sentence. You, are, you know that this is not gonna affect my practicing habits of antibiotic. And, and they'll say, oh, oh yes, 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 we know that about you, etc." But that's not the case. You know, in some of the countries, I've heard that pharmaceutical companies furnish the apartments and the uh, you know, offices of physicians and, uh, when, when you don't have regulations. And it's easy to get biased by prescribing their drugs when they've helped you one way or another financially. I think when we you know, swear the oath we shouldn't be swayed by big pharma, but I think at the end of the day, it's an individual uh, uh, decision. But I think in countries where this is regulated at the highest level, uh, things have worked better, but South America is not yet there, nor, nor, nor the Arab countries for that matter. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you for your presentation. Um, you underscore the need to engage uh, WHO, so to have this problem uh, at the highest level. So when you say WHO, you're talking about all the member states. And um, the way of working of WHO, it works with um, the national ministries of health. Uh, 
the capacity at national ministries of health is not equally um, strong. Equally. And yeah. it also, as you said, it is very much related to the um, access to health and to the fact that in many low-income countries people may not have uh, the opportunity other than go to a pharmacy, to a pharmacy um, for treatment. So I, I think you, maybe there was a misunderstanding. No, I think stewardship efforts should be at every institution level. I don't think we should wait for a national or regional. Uh, you know, I tell my students, you could do stewardship every single day in your clinic, in your uh, OPD. And so stewardship efforts should be individual. But the answer was, are you more optimistic now, was yes, because maybe we have a global umbrella, but the stewardship effort should start individually in every single hospital. And again, there are, within the same country, you have very various levels. You can have a hospital where the stewardship program is up and running and very effective, and nearby, you have a hospital where there is no stewardship, no infection control, but they transfer their sick patients to your hospital. And so this is one of the challenges that we are all facing. Another big challenge is the quality of the generic products in the developing countries. Uh, this is not very well regulated. So you'll be taking a very suboptimal dose of a drug that let ciprofloxacin, for example, you think it's enough to eradicate your infection, but it's really a very low bioavailability, just enough to select for resistance and all that. So it, it's really a multitude of problems occurring. And, but the effort should start in every single healthcare setting. So it's really important that the hospitals collaborate then. Yes. Uh, so the role for professional societies where all the doctors and the experts are should be on the same page on this. So how is that organized in the Arab League? Is there anything moving in that direction? So the, the first time we met at the Arab League was last week where uh, it was under the umbrella of a pharmaceutical company again, because where would you get the money to meet all in one room and travel and stay in a hotel? So one of the pharmaceutical company approached me and said, would you like to meet with stakeholders from the Arab League to discuss efforts in antimicrobial stewardship regionally? And I said, absolutely. So they organized the meeting in Kuwait, and we put a roadmap for what we think is an uh, uh, achievable goal. Thank you for a very nice talk. I was wondering about the role of the general public, for instance, I mean, uh, often mothers ask doctors to give an antibiotic course to their yeah. child, but if you teach them that the child gets obese when you give them antibiotics, maybe the mother will say, but don't give them antibiotics. Yeah, absolutely. And so uh, in my country, we've used a lot the media to educate the people. And so in the antimicrobial resistance week, uh, a lot of the faculty from ID from the country will appear on various popular TV programs, to talk about you know, how antibiotics can be very harmful, etc. We also have designed brochures on antimicrobial resistance and put them in all clinic, not just the ID clinic, where people who are sitting for their next appointment, they can just read them. And uh, you know, I think the public is very important because they can put a lot of pressure on the physician. And if you don't give them that amoxicillin, they might go to the next door physician. And so when you convince them that these are more harmful than beneficial. You know, it helps with your strategy. So we're using a lot of the media uh, to spread the message. And people in my country, at least, they love TV and media, unfortunately. Uh, they spend a lot of time on TV, so I wish they did less, but uh, they do. Thank you for coming, and I think you already have a next session already being planned tonight. Yeah. But before that, we have, I think, snacks and drinks, and Thank we have you. more Thank time you. for questions. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.